from that case uh, to everyone watching right now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, episode three of the Tone Dome. Uh, we have Scott Sutherland here. Uh, we are very pleased, honored, uh, thrilled, exuberant. Uh, place any positive adjective you would like to have uh, Scott Sutherland, uh, Professor Tuba, University of Redlands, uh, Principal Tuba, Redlands Symphony, uh, Riverside Philharmonic, uh, studio musician, arranger, composer, soloist, chamber musician, everything. Uh, Scott, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I, I'm I'm here. I'm alive. Uh, you know, and uh, and with all that's going on in the world, uh, that's saying something. So uh, yeah, I'm doing doing pretty well. You know, I mean, and and frankly, just being inside the Millennium Falcon gives me, again, uh, you know, a, a feeling of of a place in this world and and meaning. So yeah, definitely. you got a little bit of a degree of separation from everything too. That's good. Yeah, well, you know, when you're at least 12 parsecs away from uh, right. what, you know, the, the nastiness happening on Earth, you know, it's it's really it's really quite nice, uh, you know, to be doing my smuggling for the huts and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, just putting food on on the table. You know, would you say you say it's better than like a beach vacation? Maybe then. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> well, um, given that um, um, my my home on Earth is actually three miles from the ocean, um, you know, you, you see it all the time. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've been desensitized okay. to the beach. That's yeah, I exactly. I, I need the stars. <laughs> I need the I need the excitement of, uh, you know, um, being chased by star destroyers and such. Absolutely. <laughs> that sounds exciting. <laughs> How have you been uh, keeping uh, busy in the in the galaxy, if you will, during, uh, during <laughs> uh, <laughs> tough times? Well, uh, you know, um, recently, um, you know, g given that I haven't had a whole lot of work outside of the house, um, I, I have been keeping quite busy. My wife was joking with some friends, actually. Uh, she um, she she had a Zoom meeting with some of her old college buddies, and she said, "Scott is the busiest unemployed person I've ever met." Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's saying something. Um, yeah, I do, I, you know, I, uh, I, I've always kind of moonlighted as a, as a, as a YouTube, you know, a channel content provider, uh, a, a creator. And, uh, and, and so the, the, you know, creating multi-track videos and, and doing collaborations with friends and, you know, and others uh, throughout the world uh, is something that is is really inspiring to me and really fun. I love creating just something, whether it's classical music or it's pop music or it's film music or, or whatever uh, video games. I love just taking that and just and kind of doing my own take on it visually as well as orally and and uh, sonically. And and that's it's a lot of fun for me. And so that's what I've been doing. I, I created something uh, back in March called Tuberona Duets, where I recorded one side of a duet and, and I provided a backing track and, and uh, some instructions for anybody who wanted to participate. And uh, people sent me videos and I kind of paired them together, threw them up on my Instagram. That was a lot of fun for, for a few weeks. You know, people kind of got it to you know, do some creating with someone that they wouldn't normally uh, be creating with. And so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, and then like the whole month of uh, April was all just doing this, this big collaboration with a hundred tuba euphonium players uh, doing the music of Nimrod. I arranged the six part tuba euphonium uh, ensemble arrangement uh, of Nimrod, sent it out to, uh, and, and, you know, coordinated with Roger Bobo, the famous tuba player, and uh, he got all of his friends, I got all of my friends, and together we ended up with about 100 friends um, doing this uh, just absolute massive project. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's everything from duets to 100 piece, uh, you know, videos uh, that have been keeping me quite busy. And now, now it's uh, I, I've been kind of thinking, well, well, what's what's in the future for me? You know, how long is this going to last? What what could I possibly do with this time? Because I'm never going to have this much time ever in my entire career. I've never had this much time to think about what can I do um, if if I'm going to course correct at all. You know, with my career, what what can I do with this time and and maximize this? I don't want to be two years from now thinking, gosh, quarantine, 
would have been a great time to have done X, Y, or Z. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So, right. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at right now is, so, uh, you know, thinking about what might be next and, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Definitely. Awesome. Uh, would you say that, well, I, I know that even, even before the uh, quarantine, you were uh, making uh, projects, YouTube videos and all that stuff. But uh, it sounds like you've been doing that more now with all this time. Uh, would you say that uh, this quarantine has uh, provided uh, kind of the positive uh, outcome, so to speak, of having more time to do these projects like the 100 person uh, euphonium and uh, two long stuff? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Roger Bobo had been talking to me about that sort of, uh, you know, something along those lines for years. Uh, he was really inspired by Eric Whitaker's work with the virtual choir. I mean, Eric Whitaker about 10 years ago did, I, I forget how many it was, it was 100 people or something. He did a virtual choir with, I think it was high schoolers uh, throughout the country. And then eventually he, he, he expanded. I could be totally wrong with this. Please don't. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I think you're right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But then, and then, like a few <laughs> years after that, after the first one, he did one with two thousand right mm -hmm. singers from all around the world. It was this amazing video, and and I don't know who did the video, but uh, or you know how they how they put that together was really amazing. And so Roger saw that and was like, "We need to do this for the tuba community, the tuba euphonium community," and. I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'd be happy to contribute, but no way in heck am I going to take that on. <laughs> and then quarantine hit, and it was like, well, <laughs> I'm running out of excuses at this point, you know? Yeah. Might as well might as well take advantage of it and do something that otherwise th there's absolutely no way I'd be able to do. I, 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 I stopped counting at 100 hours that I had put into that. Yeah. Um, you know, and when am I ever going to have a hundred hours on any project ever? You know, um, so it, it it was it was a it was a, a different experience. It was a new experience, and it and it was wonderful just to kind of connect with people that I wouldn't have normally been able to connect with all around the world. I mean, there there are people I've been I was emailing from Italy and Japan and Norway and. Uh, you know, I mean, Mexico, South America, um, South Africa, I, we had, we had representatives all around the world, uh, all six continents. It was really wonderful just to kind of bring everything a little closer together and bring this sense of community when otherwise we would be very isolated. So yeah, this, it was, it was a wonderful experience. It's, it's amazing. The technology, I mean, it, we just take it for granted now because we had to go, we switched over for school and all that stuff, but the technology it's just right here. Like we can have a Zoom meeting and talk about things and discuss. And I just think that's yeah. Awesome. No, no, you're exactly right. I mean, I uh, it's it's funny being on the like you know the in the academia side of things, you know, the faculty side of things. Uh, I know we've had we had conversations where um, people just did not want to go online. It was you know uh, it was something that uh, was pushed. And now people are forced to do it, and now they're accustomed to it. And I think um, I think our options for uh, you know um, connecting uh, in an educational sense are, are are now so much more numerous. Right. Um, and uh, and people are much more open to these ideas now. Uh, whereas, I, I, so I was touring with the brass quintet uh, for uh, eleven or twelve years. Um, and at one point, we were on the road for 132 days uh, in a calendar year, and it was it was a lot, um, especially given that I had um, all of my my private students. Um, you know, I was teaching classes uh, with Redlands and, and such, and uh, it 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 took a lot of faith um, uh, from my administration to allow me to do things through FaceTime, through Zoom, through you know, uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, doing these kind of virtual meetings. And um, I got a lot of pushback um, initially, but I don't think that's going to be the case anymore. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people, you know, this is, it, it was a fear of the unknown before. And now right. people understand just how powerful this really can be and how efficient it can be. Right. You know, how much more you can do now. Um, yeah. 
you know, with uh, all of these virtual meetings. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I know the companies are like even planning on canceling leases with buildings so that they just have people stay at home and do their Zoom meetings online and stuff like that. So Isn't that we'll, we'll see how things change with all of this going on. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very cool. And it's exciting. It's definitely exciting. Definitely. Well, I have to, I have to ask because, you yes. know, I'm, I'm, well, if you have to, no, I no, have if to. it was optional, then, <laughs> you know, you could probably let it go, but <laughs> if it's mandatory, I, I am going to give you that space. Please, please tell me. So I'm, I'm sitting with two tuba players, right? And I'm just, I'm yeah. just curious that instrument's freaking big. So like, yeah. what drives you to you start? Fe- Wait, I'm sorry. Do you feel intimidated? Do you feel <laughs> you're outnumbered? Do you feel how inferior you might yeah. be right now? I think now? the ratio in an orchestra, like three to one, four to one, is just about <laughs> right to keep you guys under control, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, and then every time there's two of us on stage, usually there's like, you know, four of you guys. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, you just, you know, somehow you guys got to <laughs> just kind of up your odds. We have to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so your question was... I, my question is just how you how do you get started on that? Like you, I mean, you, it's a big commitment. I feel like to start the tuba and like, can you bring us through your process of picking and maybe Brandon too? I'm curious. Yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually I'm curious. I, you know, <laughs> I, I think a lot of us uh, we we usually come to the to to the uh, the instrument in different ways. But um, for for me, I started out on piano. I was eight years old, um, and, but my dad played trombone. And so we had a trombone in the house. Uh, he was not a professional, but a, a really great amateur. He was wonderful in high school and, you know, in college, but uh, uh, put it down for uh, a different career, but always had one around in the house. So I, um, I picked that up in fourth grade and played it for a year. And then they cut the elementary school band program. And so, uh, and then I went to middle school and played it, played it for a year in middle school, and then they cut the middle school program. Oh man! So I, yeah, so I had I, I had a year, and then I had like a year or two off, and then I had a year, and then I had a year or two off that I just I didn't play. And, um, then I got to high school. They kept the high school program around. Fortunately, I played uh, trombone for a year, um, and then um, because the band program was so small um, and the numbers were um, so limited. Uh, my band director was was constantly trying to kind of fill out certain sections and make sure that there were strong players on every instrument. And so whenever he had kind of, uh, you know, um, a, a, a talent pool on one instrument, he, he tried to disperse that a little bit more. So, and rightly so. Sure. So I moved over to uh, Baritone uh, for my uh, my sophomore year. And then in my junior year, uh, all of our tuba players graduated, uh, and he switched a tenor saxophone player and me, uh, a baritone player over to tuba mm. and was basically like, here, you're going to play this. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I was like, okay, sure. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, of course, you know, I, I got the story, you know, well, if, you know, you played this instrument, you're, you're almost guaranteed a, a big scholarship to college. And, um, that's, you know, I mean, I think all of us have gone on to college and realized, well, that's, it's, it's actually not totally true. Yeah. Um, cause you still have to be really, really excellent and deserve that scholarship. So, um, uh, fortunately I got lessons pretty quickly. I got lessons because my next door neighbors were a professional violinist and bass trombonist of all things. Um, and I had this huge con recording bell, B flat, four valve. It was, uh, I think it was decommissioned from the U S Navy I had a big stamp on the bell. Cool. Uh, yeah. I was in Los Angeles unified school district. Uh, we didn't have any money. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was able to um, audition and get a scholarship through the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association, um, gave me a scholarship to get some lessons. And um, and because my neighbor was a bass trombone player and knew the tuba player in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, I was able to get discounted lessons with Norm Pearson, which I, I would not be here today without without Norm Pearson. Um, he got me he got me my start. 
uh, he believed in me. He even taught me um, beyond that scholarship and he was incredibly generous. And he basically said, you need to go to USC. And I said, okay. So I applied to two <laughs> schools. One school I knew I could get into because of my grades. And I just, I got in. And then I hoped and prayed that I would go into USC. Both of them were local. I mean, uh, and because I, I just, I really didn't know any better. And then, uh, and then the rest is history. So Brandon, what, what is, uh, what, what is your story? I'm, I'm curious. How did you get, how did you get started with the <laughs> instrument? <laughs> well, I, I was actually a clarinetist until okay. my uh, senior year of high school. Oh uh, I lived in uh, Baltimore at the time, and uh, my family and I had moved out to uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was auditioning for uh, uh, performing arts schools. I came across uh, Lehigh Valley for our high school for the arts. Uh, I was auditioning for them on clarinet, and uh, they thought I played well, but uh, the band director said, you know, Brandon, uh, if I can ask you something, uh, our tuba player recently graduated. Uh, if you agree to play tuba, <laughs> even if it's just for the uh, winter concert, we'll let you in, no problem. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we'll send you the acceptance letter the next day. So I, <laughs> I said, why not? Uh, so I got the acceptance letter. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've never looked back. It was, uh, it was more fun than I thought. Uh, my first teacher wound up being Al Bear. I uh, wow. ended up at the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, now I'm going to McGill in the fall. Yeah, so it's wow. been, it's been That's awesome. ride for sure. So the answer to my question is it has to be forced upon you then. <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, I, 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 I have found that uh, there's less people that are like, the only instrument I want is that monster in the corner. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I have found less of those stories than, um, yeah, you're not allowed in here. In fact, my teacher, Tommy Johnson, um, he was a, 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 a trumpet player, a cornetist, and... Um, and he really wanted to play in this concert band and and they wouldn't let him in. He was young, he, I, I think he was 13 at the time or, or, or younger. And um, they said, the only way you're gonna get into this band is if you play tuba. He's like, wow. all right. And then you have uh, arguably one of the greatest tuba players in the history of the instrument was born uh, out of that, you know? So right. yes. Um, we have a grand tradition of being forced into this instrument, <laughs> then loving it, and then dominating uh, the music world. So, awesome. That's I, great. Uh, how, how, that, how that goes. So. Wow. Well, there, yeah, that, that's yeah. my answer then. <laughs> that's awesome. So where did, you, where did you end up going to school? Did you... You said well. I went to USC. Okay. Um, so University of Southern California uh, in Los Angeles. It was twenty minutes from my house. Great. Um, Twenty-two minutes when there was no traffic. So there was a six six minute uh, window there uh, uh, in in each day where there was no traffic. Um, and otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise it it would take you forty five minutes to an hour to to do that. And um, I went there, went there for four years, and then I went to the Crosstown Rival. I went to UCLA uh, to, again, study with Tommy Johnson. He's taught at both schools. Uh, UCLA, I had gotten married um, going into my senior year of college uh, at USC, and I needed to not spend money on school. I needed school to spend money on me. Right. So I went to, I went to the, the, state, the state university uh, for, uh, for my graduate school. And uh, they were able to, you know, pay pay the way uh, there. So, great. Um, so yeah. So that's where I, I, you know, Tommy was 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 pushing me to try to go international, maybe study with Roger Bobo in Switzerland or such. But um, I had gotten married, and um, my wife had a really great job, and our family was there, so we decided to uh, to stick around in LA. Oh, great. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so yeah. I there was uh, you mentioned how your band programs got defunded constantly, and yeah. we we did a little bit of research into uh, Presidio Brass, uh, mm -hmm. and the mission statement is kind of reminding me of what you're talking about right now. Uh, maybe you could talk about like how you chose to defend the arts and all that stuff through that group. I yeah, think. yeah. Uh, so back in the 70s, uh, California uh, passed a, a, a proposition called Proposition 13, which um, it, it effecti effectively uh, froze your property taxes at a, at a 
at the rate in which it was last assessed. So in other words, when you bought the house, generally that's, that's how much your, your property taxes could not go up from there. So, um, that's, uh, you know, the, the absolute, uh, you know, uh, reader's digest version of that. Sure. So, uh, what ended up happening, uh, was that, uh, the, the amount of money coming in from property taxes was uh, effectively cut from year to year, and, and the schools were getting less money uh, from those property taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the natural consequence for that was cutting of the arts. And, and it, it happened over years and years and years. Um, you know, my experience was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, there, were other, there were other revenues that kind of ebbed and flowed. And so sometimes uh, these programs came back. Um, uh, largely, the elementary school programs were, were ultimately cut. Um, it, it's very rare to find an elementary school program in California. It, they do exist, but they're rare. Hmm. Um, uh, the middle school programs are, 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 are hit and miss, but, uh, most of them are still around. Um, but they're, they're largely defunded. So, um, so that, you know, you don't have access to large amounts of instruments, you know, uh, first rate instruments and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, with all of these cuts, um, uh, a friend of mine, Sean Roish and I, um, and then a, a few of the others uh, who started Presidio Brass. The, it, the original mission was to start a brass quintet, uh, get some nonprofit funding. We had started a nonprofit, and to go into schools and create um, kind of uh, uh, cross curriculum uh, programs where we could present uh, a musical program that also had uh, an English element or a, a history element or a math element, and and. Uh, um, that was the original mission. And then, uh, we started doing some gigs around town and then we actually were contacted and got in, in, in connection with a, uh, a live touring, uh, company that, uh, set up tours around the country, uh, kind of the outgrowth of a, uh, a company called community concerts. And, um, this one was called live on stage and the, contacted us, set up some tours, and then we started touring. And so that mission kind of changed. And, and then what we did was we kind of uh, refocused our efforts so that what we could do is every time we did a, an evening concert, it's kind of the Dallas Brass model, where we, every time we would do an evening concert, we would couple that with going into uh, the neighborhood school and, and helping to inspire students uh, to uh, achieve excellence in music, um, maybe bring... Uh, some kids that haven't uh, thought about playing an instrument, you know, maybe introducing that to some of those younger kids. If, it, if we went into a high school or a college, we were trying to equip them with uh, better musical ideas and ways that they could get, uh, you know, uh, higher levels of excellence on their instrument. Um, yeah, so it, 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 the mission sort of changed over time, but uh, uh, that was that was the general idea. And it all came from you know, uh, these cuts uh, that I, I was very much affected by growing up uh, in Los Angeles, uh, in, in especially the late 80s and early 90s. So. Sure. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. uh, on, yeah. on the topic of that uh, brass quintet, uh, how, how yes. did you uh, get started with them, uh, both playing and arranging, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, well, um, so initially, uh, it you know, we were, we were trying to do popular music that kids would latch on to. So, um, we were doing, uh, the, the idea was, was, was more classically based. Um, you know, uh, some of the non, nonprofit funding sources, um, uh, they liked the idea of bringing in classical music. So, um, and then, uh, you know, the, the members had individual skill sets and we weren't finding, that uh, some of these standard published arrangements were really working for the group. We kind of wanted our own identity. So I started writing and I, I didn't have a ton of experience, especially with brass quintet before that. I think I had arranged one brass quintet or maybe two before Presidio Brass. Um, and so I really kind of cut my teeth uh, in, in arranging for chamber music with, with that group. And I started with some light classical numbers um, or arranging orchestral pieces for 
you know, large orchestral pieces down to uh, for brass quintet. So I started out with a, a medley of Copeland uh, uh, pieces, uh, you know, Fanfare for the Common Man and Simple Gifts and Hoedown. Um, I did a I did a four minute version of Scheherazade, um, kind of the main themes of Scheherazade, and, and just made it for brass quintet. Uh, Night on Bald Mountain. I did a uh, a four minute version of nine on bald mountain, you know, just kind of the, the big, the big moments, um, you know, trying to, trying to squeeze that down to, uh, just, just five players, but trying to recreate that sound and that excitement from those pieces. We did a whole suite of Debussy works, uh, Ruslan and Ludmidla, um, originally like a five minute version of that piece. And then we cut it down to like a 90 second, mm. uh, burst just as an opener, just as a, you know, smack them over the head with a lot of notes, yes. uh, cool. you know, opener kind of thing, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's, you know, it was really out of necessity that I got started with arranging. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I did a little bit on the commercial side. I did some jazz arrangements. Um, we uh, initially, we had someone who was a really great improviser and then that person left and we, we got someone else who was strictly classical. And so uh, we were, you know, the, the, the jazz side of things um, was a little hit or miss uh, at times. And, but it, after a, a couple of years, we really kind of like honed in on a particular uh, program that was that was really great for the audience, really great for kids. And it largely uh, centered around film music. And so we um, came out with an album called Sounds of the Cinema that uh, had uh, much of the program that we were doing on um, our evening concerts. And that really was kind of the hallmark program for the group uh, for many, many years. And uh, a lot of it included piano, because I was, uh, you know, I played piano as well as tuba. Um, so I did a lot of, you know, back and forth uh, on the stage. It helped uh, create a different sound for the group. It kind of set us apart because, you know, nobody else, that I knew of at the time was using piano in a brass quintet uh, program. Our first tune was um, was Bohemian Rhapsody. We we started out with that one, um, and it's a fun tune. And we had the excuse that it was used in Wayne's World, so uh, we could use it in our Sounds of the Cinema program. And yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, then it, it was it was also a great excuse to introduce the piano. The piano ended up being a hit with the audience. Naturally, that tune is a big hit. And, um, and so we started introducing more and more piano into, into the program. We totally, we, orig originally we started out with uh, Jack Gale's uh, West Side Story arrangement, which is fabulous. But then we tweaked it and eventually just kind of transformed it into a, um, a version, our own version that included a lot of piano, included some hand percussion, um, I, I revisited that I Feel Pretty, which has a, a nice little tuba solo at the beginning, and I turned it into an entire tuba uh, from start to, you know, the Jack Gale was kind of the, uh, the inspiration for it, but then, uh, you know, turned it into a true tuba feature um, with choreography and the whole bit, which was, uh, you know, quite, quite the adventure for the audience. Yeah, uh, you can see cool. that on YouTube. You can um, check out "I Feel Pretty" and Presidio Brass. Uh, there's a live, there's a lot of video on there. A couple of them, so it's it's fun. There's a kick line. Yeah. I mean, if you want to see guys <laughs> with no business dancing doing a kick line, that's the video for you. So uh, yeah, go 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 check that out. So yeah, it's fun. It's fun. That's awesome. awesome. Seems seems so creative. Like the that kind of group, like Manazel Brass and Presidio and everything, they all do have like the acting kind of element to it. That's it's so it such seems like such a fun thing to do. It just seems hard to like get people together who would be on board to do something like that. That you know? is the biggest thing. People have asked me, you know, how do you start a brass quintet? How do you start, you know, doing a touring ensemble? And man, the first thing is you gotta you gotta get people that are all going in the same direction. And a lot of times people's first inclination is to just get the best players they know. And, and if there is one thing I learned from, from touring and, and helping to uh, get a group together and helping to, um, you know, uh, get the group going in a particular direction, 
It's that you have to have five people or four people or six people or whatever group you have um, that all have the, a similar vision. You want different ideas, but if the core values of those individuals and the core vision of uh, individuals in the group is different, you are going to have uh, conflict and a lot of it. And, and, and that is definitely um, a, a source of frustration when you want to try to move a group in a particular direction and, and people just don't see it, you know, and, and, and they don't have to, you know, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's okay to have different ideas and it's good to have lots of different ideas, but it can stall the momentum of the group if, if people aren't all going in the right direction, in the similar direction. So, you, you know, uh, some people have, some people have taken that as, as a, uh, an excuse to have one person in charge and, and everyone else just yeah. listen to that one person. That's very easy to have a singular vision at that point. Um, but, uh, Presidio really wanted to have, uh, everyone, uh, have, uh, you know, equal ownership over the vision of the group. And so, you know, everyone, at least at that time, everyone was, uh, was involved in, um, the decision-making, uh, you know, everyone had equal say in, in the business side of things. Um, and naturally that's going to create some conflict. So, but, um, but ultimately, uh, when everyone is, is, uh, you know, into the idea of doing a kick line, if everyone is into the idea of performing Star Wars on a brass chamber music concert and not Ewald, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's like, you, you, you know, and then it can be really, it can be really special. You know, um, if everyone has their moment, if, if, um, everyone has something that they're contributing and, and is highlighted in a program, then it's, it's, it's a really special thing. And it's, and it was a really great time um, uh, for me, uh, just developing as a musician, developing as a writer, developing as an entrepreneur and getting ideas, uh, especially for the business side of things, what marketing is like, you know, what managing is like, what recording is like. Um, you know, I was, I, I, I was always very, very, very much involved in the uh, recording aspects of things. I was always in the sound booth. I was you know, always helping out with editing and mastering and all that. I learned so much from that process. And that helped me as I moved on um, after the Brass Quintet. Um, my wife uh, did, you know, she, she, she wanted me home. Uh, I was just gone too much. My kids were growing up. I wanted to be home. Uh, I was seeing them grow up uh, before my eyes, but, you know, at a distance. And I needed to be more involved. So therefore, I, I needed I needed to get off I needed to get off the road, and the um, the YouTube channel was one way that I could help stay uh, relevant um, while um, and and get my name out there without uh, without kind of the humble brag thing where you know you, uh, you 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 get on a good gig and you get on you yeah. You know, do the little selfie and oh, I'm just humble, blessed uh, to be here with <laughs> such and such orchestra doing such and such studio gig, whatever it is, you know. Right. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be that guy. So um, what I would rather do is just kind of showcase what I can do, and do it in a creative way and do it in kind of a different way, you know. And I saw, I saw a market there, you know. I saw a lot of people that were doing um, the multi-track, multi-frame music video, but not in tuba. Um, and, uh, there, there were a couple of things, but the, um, they weren't at, at, at kind of the, the, the quality standard that I was really striving for. So, um, they were really cool. Um, but you know, I kind of wanted to do the next level. So that's, uh, that, that's where I saw the kind of a hole in the market and, uh, and just dived in with my first video. Cool. And all of your experiences led up like contributed to that like arranging and everything I mean, that's so cool absolutely yeah i do i do a i do a, a talk um that i've done you know in colleges and conferences and such and, and in fact I, I think i put it up i put it up on my youtube channel um from the army conference uh that happened back in february but um one of the things i talk about is the fact that this channel this youtube channel and developing these videos helps um you know 
you know, it, it, it gets me thinking and, and dabbling in all of the different areas that I have been able to kind of cultivate over the years in my career. And it's fun, mm. you know. Um, without the brass quintet, I wasn't playing piano at all. You know, this is a way for me to incorporate playing piano and even, you know, uh, every once in a while playing like a jazz solo, which I never get to do anymore, you know, but I can if I'm the one in total control of the content, you know, if I'm the one calling the shots, I can, you know, and doing the arrangement, I can say, hey, I want to do a piano solo here and I'm going to do it, you know, um, you know, uh, I have I have my daughter um, who is kind of running uh, the camera. Uh, while I'm doing things. And she helps me a lot, especially on the social media side and picking tunes and kind of getting, uh, you know, a, a take. She's 16 years old, getting a, a young person's take on what might be relevant right now, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, these are all the, these different aspects are what make uh, these kinds of projects really exciting, I think. Um, and, and it, and allows me to, again, use all these different skills that I've cultivated uh, into what I'm hoping is a unique product and something that people are interested in and kind of set themselves apart sure. because of everything I can, I can, uh, I can offer. Right. Great. Great. Uh, on, yeah. on, on the topic of this uh, YouTube channel, uh, Sam and I saw uh, last time we checked, which was a few days ago or so, you're at uh, 13,000 uh, subscribers. Uh, that's, that's great. I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's at 20,000 now. If you checked a few days ago, um, yeah, it's just, it, no, yeah, no, I just, just hit the 13,000 mark. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm assuming I'm about two weeks away from 2 million channel views. Nice. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Congrats. Yeah. That's well, awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, how, cheers. how were you able to, yeah, cheers. <laughs> how were you able to, uh, spread it? I, 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 yeah, I guess spread the word about your uh, projects, your videos, uh, that I guess could be useful as well for someone trying to promote uh, their chamber group, let's say. Or their yeah. podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, I, think, I, I, I think what, I think the, the, most, the most important thing is to, is, to, is to define what makes you unique. Um, you know, you need to set yourself apart. Um, and this, this goes to what I was saying before. What, why would people check out my channel? There's lots of people doing things right now. Why would people check out my channel? One reason is that, um, you know, I offer, uh, a, you know, a certain level of quality um, that I think I set myself apart from some people. Um, uh, just in terms of, you know, visuals and, you know, and, and the editing and, and the, the level of, qual- uh, you know, high-end uh, audio quality. Not ju- I'm, I'm not really talking about the playing because you assume that everyone plays well, you know. You assume everyone on a podcast can, you know, carry on a conversation and ask good <laughs> questions and have interesting content. So what is going to make yours different than someone else that happens to be doing also a brass related podcast that, you know, what is it going to, what is your defining characteristic that, um, art? And for me, um, uh, it, it goes to what I was saying before. I saw a hole in, in the market for someone to do high end tuba euphonium ensemble pieces, larger ensemble, like, you know, six people eight people, even uh, at one point, uh, my Jaws video, I think I have 10 brass, you know, playing, you know, for Chimbasi. Yeah, that's awesome. Is that my even favorite word? Chimbasi. <laughs> <laughs> Chimbasi, I'm sure it depends <laughs> on where you're from, but, you know, like, who has that? You know, that, that, but, you know, um, there are some amazing solo euphonium uh, pieces, uh, you know, videos out there. There are some amazing chimbasso, single chimbasso, jazz chimbasso. There, there are some videos out there. That's not what I'm providing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing film music. Most people weren't doing film music or video game music. But lots of very popular YouTubers were doing, you know, popular tunes, you know? Um, yeah, you, you, you look at the Lindsey Sterlings and the Piano Guys and mm-hmm. Taylor Davis and some of these other folks that are playing more convention conventional you know more popular 
classical, you know, uh, it, the kinds of uh, classical instruments, uh, classical music instruments that uh, most of the audience will identify. What is classical music? Oh, that's piano. Mm -hmm. What's classical music? Oh, that's cello. That's violin. No, those are the classic, you right. know, instruments. Um, and they're doing popular music. That's one way that they set themselves apart. You know, um, and what is it? Two cellos, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what I brought to the table or I'm trying to bring to the table is, 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 is that kind of high level audio and, and video production, but in tube euphonium, which I had it, uh, you know, at this point I had seen much and hopefully people will identify me with, um, with that sort of content, you know, um, even, even while there is a lot of people doing it now, you know, a lot of people are putting out videos and a lot of people are just getting started. Um, but, uh, maybe they haven't quite, uh, found their individual, their unique voice. And that's what, you know, that's, I, that's what I would recommend to anybody starting out, you know, what is going to make you truly unique? Um, I've talked to a lot of people starting a brass quintet and, and they're like, well, you know, what really makes us unique is that we play, you know, re brass Renaissance music really at a high level, like really, really great. All these empire brass, you know, um, arrangements really, really great. You know, you should hear our piccolo trumpet player. And it's like, that's, you know, I'm sure that's great. And I'd love to hear you, but that's not going to set yourself apart. That's, mm -hmm. That, you know, there is just too many people. You know, we can play the Malcolm Arnold even better than Center City Brass Quintet. <laughs> I doubt that. I've heard him. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, but, you know, you know what I mean? It's like people will say, no, that, that's, that's what we can do. We can do what other people have done, but we can do it incrementally better. And that's just not going to set yourself apart. You know, what is truly going to make yourself unique? You know, Presidio um, was able to, to do different things. We were doing some different repertoire that not a lot of people were doing. We were able to include piano. But, you know, at, at least at the time that I was with the group, it still struggled to try to really set themselves apart. It, it, it is amazing how people just kind of assumed it was another brass quintet. Right. Sometimes just having the name brass quintet in there is problematic because you just assume, well, why would I hire you when I can hire Boston Brass, which is a known entity? Right. Why would I listen to this podcast when I know I can listen to this podcast, which is going to give me something similar? You know, right. it's like, OK, so uh, that's not to discourage you. That's actually to encourage yeah. you. Now you have a direction. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you have a way. Now you know what the problem is. Now you can try to solve it. You know, and and my gosh, Presidio, my channel as well. All of these different avenues, these creative avenues that I, I have, these um, these roads that I've been on, it's all been just well. What does the market need? What do people want? And how can I package it in such a way to set myself apart from what is happening outside and and, and be above the fray? you know, be above the noise, you know, how can mm -hmm. I hear, how can people hear my voice when there are so many other voices out there, you know, uh, what is going to make myself, you know, my unique business proposition, you know, you, you, you probably heard that, that particular phrase. Um, right. That's, 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 that's what I would recommend, you know, um, what is going to make you unique. And, um, and that can be hard to find, but you know, um, and it's going to be a lot of trial and error and you're going to, you know, the universally, I'm not speaking directly to you guys, but you know, just anybody watching, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about, and, and it can be frustrating at times and it can, you know, Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many videos I've done where I was like, okay, this is the one that people are going to really latch on to. And it's going to go Christopher bill, happy, uh, viral. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I wasn't that delusional, no, <laughs> I, you know, that lightning is not striking twice. That was, that yeah. was the perfect video at the perfect time looping and all of that was like a, a thing. Mm -hmm. And then it was the most popular tune ever. And he's like, yeah, yeah. all and these things, like, everything had to intersect. Perfect. Yeah. 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 yeah mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, it was, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, amazing. I could, I could rewatch that video a, a million times. People have. Mm-hmm. I forget how, what it is, three, four million views probably now. Sure. Uh, you know, it's it's like that, that is absolute lightning in a bottle. And um, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. He, he did it exactly right. But he had done tons of videos, very similar videos before that. But that was the one. And so, you know, I have I have been in this creative mode. I'm like, oh, this one. I have put so many ideas in there. And, and this is just the coolest thing. Um, I can think uh, a couple of just what I think are basic relative flops. Um, I did a, a, a video, Scherzo for X-Wings, which um, was insanely difficult for me. I, I am not a technician. I am not a guy that's going to go, on, dig-a, 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 dig-a. I'm not <laughs> that guy, you know, putting a bunch of notes in there. I'm not, I'm just not good at that. And, and so I worked really hard on that and, you know, really technical euphonium parts. I put your basso in there, I put piano in there. And then I put a lot of thought into the video aspect of it. I got this really cool background. I did it on a green screen, much like this. And, you know, I flirted out. I made it look like I was in some sort of like rebel bunker. And I was like, this is great. And it went nowhere and it still goes nowhere. And I have no (laughs) idea why. Um, I did a video um, where it was, uh, it was like a a live looping video um, on Libertango. I thought, okay, all right, Mm -hmm. I'm going to finally get, you know, all these snotty, uh, you know, classical people that kind of thumb their nose at my channel. I'm going to finally get them to, to watch my stuff. And, and I'm going to do it in a unique way. I'm going to do Piazzolla, which everyone loves Piazzolla, even the, you know, I mean, the popular music people, the classical music, everyone loves Piazzolla. So I'm going to do Piazzolla, but I'm going to do it with uh, loops. I'm going to do it on piano and then I'm going to do it with it with a shaker and clapping and I'm going to do euphonium. I'm going to do tuba and everyone's going to lose their mind. And then I'm going to hire, not hire. I hope he's not watching because I, he's like, wait a minute, you hired me. Um, a good friend of mine who is a video production guy to do it all in one take. Mm. That's going to blow people's minds. Nope. It went nowhere. Uh, that video went absolutely nowhere. And I still, I did emails where people go, Hey, that's like my favorite video. I'm like, great. Why didn't anybody else watch it? You know? <laughs> so, you know, and then I do something super quick and dirty, like the Avengers, mm-hmm. right when the Avengers comes out and it gets 130,000 views in a few weeks, you know? Right. It's like, gosh, you know, I mean, Avengers is, I, spoiler alert, I thought that music was really lame. <laughs> I, am i allowed to say that I don't know. of course you can I mean, say whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> but you know you can play it in an epic style and that's fun it's, it's it's it can be fun to play right but musically speaking it's a pretty i mean like alan mm-hmm. silvestri went from from back to the future which i think is some of the most inspired film music ever to that and I, ooh, oh, it breaks my heart. <laughs> and so I put that together, and it gets a lot of views. And it's like, why can't cool stuff get views? And 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 there you go. You know, some of it has to be. You know, you can have a, a unique proposition. I play tubing euphonium, but I'm going to do it in a in, in a popular way. It's something that's going to be that, that you know other people that wouldn't necessarily watch a tubing euphonium video and maybe they'll be uh, interested in watching you. Um, you know, that is something that, you know, I, uh, I, 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 so a friend of mine, Tim, um, plays uh, trombone in San Francisco and he uh, is doing a, uh, an interview, I think today, and I think I'm missing it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no worries, no worries. Uh, I'll, I'll catch it, I'll catch it later, I'm sure. Um, he is a mixologist, a brilliant mixologist. The right. guy can do yeah. cocktails like, <laughs> cool. like amazing. And then he's a freaking amazing trombone player. And so he's doing a, a, a it's like art and cocktails. Nice. There is, there is a unique nice. business proposition. That, you know, talking about mixology and talking about art, those two things, that is what is their particular, that particular 
podcast or, or stream or whatever. I, I had not heard of it until yesterday. But what a kind of a cool kind of combination. And that is what is making them unique. And I don't know if they're finding success. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But it's, it's, it's unique. And that is something that I would, you know, just um, suggest to everyone out there trying a new endeavor. You know, what is going to set your, your content apart from everyone else? Um, Andrew Hitz is, is really wonderful uh, when, whenever he talks. He, he talks about, um, you know, everyone knows who flew over the uh, Atlantic Ocean first in a solo flight. You know, they all know it's Charles Lindbergh and he did it first. And the second guy did it faster mm -hmm. and he did it with like less fuel and he, he did it way better and no one knows his name. Right. But everyone knows the third person because it was Amelia Earhart because she was a first. All right. So you can either be a first or you can do it completely different. Mm. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, right. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I would encourage, you know, find a different way to, to deliver something similar and, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the same vein, you know, hitting some of the same people, but doing it in, in such a unique way that people are going to latch onto it and notice it because man, right. everyone's coming out with things. And, yeah. uh, you know, you got to figure out a way to set yourself apart. So that's cool. It seems uh, like you're, you're trying to like combine different audiences, like different people have different interests. So you, what you're skilled at, you want to combine those things to make your audience as wide as possible. And yeah, absolutely. Sort of because I mean, you know, I mean, right now I'm having a conversation with you two guys and you two guys are different than anybody else. I will ever do an interview with. Hopefully. Why are you doing <laughs> yeah. that? No, 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 no. In a great way. No, no, great yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, of course. Everyone, <laughs> has, everyone has something unique to offer. And right. so what is that uniqueness? You know, why do people hire me for anything? Well, uh, I don't know. It, uh, I, certainly there are better tuba players out there than me. There are crazy, I mean, pretty much 99% of the euphonium players out there are better euphonium players out there. 99% of the piano players out there are better piano players than me. Why would you hire me for any of those things? You know, why would you hire me as your record producer? I've sat in the record booth or in the recording booth helping people, you know, mm -hmm. why would you hire me? Well, I've done it. Right. There's something, you know, unique about my experiences. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just the fact that I can be in there and say, Hey guys, that wasn't a very good take. Why don't you do it again? You know, um, it's, I have skills as a ranger and I look at the score and I go, Hey, you know, actually I'm seeing this and I'm wondering if you guys can flip those parts or you can bring this line out versus this line, because I actually think that there's a problem with the arrangement or you guys aren't performing the arrangement to the, whatever it is, you know, or my skills, um, you know, on piano have developed this sense of harmony, um, you know, and, 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 and layers that, most people who play up, you know, just a monophonic instrument don't necessarily have, you know, and maybe that is what is setting me apart. I'm, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't be sure, but my gosh, there's, there are way better people out there than, uh, than me in, in all of those individual areas, but it's the combination that, that right. may, that may set me apart. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. Uh, that is, <laughs> Uh, can I get off my soapbox now? <laughs> oh, we were just enjoying it too much. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was learning. I was being inspired. I was. Is that is that what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. actually, that, that, that was that was always the motto that, that we came up with with uh, Presidio Brass was be inspired. Uh, you know, nice. um, I'm not sure I did it. I, I I think I just beat people over the heads, but uh, you know, some some people need that. You know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> They do. Some people, some people need a kind, relaxing voice. That's not me. Mm. So, you know. <laughs> they came to the wrong place today. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they don't come to me for that. You know? That's all right. Awesome. That's all right. Well, uh, going on with these experiences, uh, yeah. like we said at the beginning, uh, arranging, soloing, uh, chamber musician, studio musician, uh, Pretty, pretty much everything. Uh, how, how have you benefited from all these experiences? And do you find yourself, uh, I, I guess I would say, is it easy to uh, maybe go from the studio on, uh, I don't know, Monday afternoon, one style of playing, if you will, uh, going to a concert with 
the Los Angeles Philharmonic uh, for like right of spring or something uh, the following day, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's a lot of it's a lot of fun, and that definitely took me a while to to kind of develop. Um, I knew from the beginning I never wanted to be a, 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 a jack of all trades and a master of none. You know, I definitely, um, for instance, I, I, even as I was playing tuba, I was playing a little piano, I played trombone in, uh, in my high school jazz band. And I, and I played it also in college a little bit. Um, but I had to, I never wanted my, my classical tuba playing to suffer. So that, that was, that was the number one thing was that I needed to make sure that I was, a plus qualified on at least my my primary instrument. Okay, but in addition to that, I never said no. Rarely did I say no to any situation um, that maybe I was a little unqualified for. I, I was asked to do a Dixieland band uh, in um, in college. I had zero experience putting together bass lines. I had some experience knowing what harmony was, and so I could sort of read a chord chart for piano. Never done it on tuba, certainly never soloed on tuba. Um, but it was something that I said yes to. I got to do Dixieland festivals um, around the state, and that was, uh, do a little touring. It was really, really fun. Um, and that was a really, really great experience. It was something that I didn't say no to. And I, I thrusted myself into a really uncomfortable position. I've done plenty of piano gigs that I was wholly unqualified for. Um, and I apologize to all those people that I played <laughs> juries for, or I, those choirs I accompanied, or that jazz band that uh, they asked me to take a solo. And I'm like, all right, guys, as long as it's all white keys, I'm okay. Uh, you know, it's like, I, uh, you know? <laughs> Don't make me play too many fast things. You know, <laughs> I'm a tuba player. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it broadened my horizons, you know? And that experience in the Dixieland band, as uncomfortable as it was, it gave me enough of a foundation that now um, I should be, actually, let's see, this is early June, I should be rehearsing with my funk band um, to play 80 days over the summer uh, at the San Diego Zoo wow. uh, on sousaphone. Uh, that's what I should be doing right now if it weren't quarantine, you know? And I would never, ever in a million years have been qualified to do that in any stretch of the imagination. Now, there are still way better people at doing funk sousaphone than me. But um, I also uh, contribute to that group with arranging. I also help, uh, you know, with some of the, uh, the production um, side of things. So I offer something else, you know? Um, and I... Uh, you know, it, I think it would be it'd be hard for them to uh, replace me completely. Right. They can replace me with a better sousaphone player, without a question. But to have the total package might be a little harder. There are definitely people out there, but it might be a little harder. And that that has helped that has helped definitely my career. Um, I uh, but I can I. I you know, just, just on a physical level, I have to learn to be able to play some of these gigs and, and maintain my chops and, and warm down and warm up in such a way that I am able to switch gears and then go to go from that gig. I have done plenty of times where I've had to do that zoo gig on sousaphone that night. And then the next morning is something with a major symphony orchestra, you know, um, that has happened many times actually and it's that's a tough thing um but i you know a lot of it has to do just with the physical side um uh, uh you know warming down making sure my chops feel fresh uh, i am not overdoing it but uh you know the different experiences i've had throughout my life uh, allow me to kind of switch gears all of these different opportunities where i can say yes and thrust myself into a wholly unqualified position, which a lot of times I'm still feel wholly unqualified for, you know, I mean, go listen to Bonorama, mm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and listen to the sousaphone player and I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now. And I apologize, but 
I mean, the guy sounds freaking unbelievable. And I'm sure the group that I play with would love to have someone like that. And they're feel a little uh, that they're stuck with me. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, but you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's the ability to, you know, put that together, um, go, go record some, uh, later on that day and kind of switch those gears. Um, that just, that just comes from saying yes as often as possible and making yourself as uncomfortable over and over and over again as, as possible. And that's the only way you, that's the only way you grow is, is, is through discomfort. Sure. Yeah. So, so which, what, I mean, you talked about the zoo that that seems really interesting to me. So it's fun. Do you like, do you like playing for animals better than humans then? Is that uh, <laughs> actually, uh, hopefully none of those zoo people are watching right now, but I, I because uh, zoo people, we're, we're, well, like the animal people, right, right. Not, they, they, uh, they don't love us. We're right. loud and the animals uh, don't love us, but um, no, it, we're drawn to the people. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's I just sure. wanted to ask, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, they try to keep the animals as far away from us as humanly possible. But, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're, we're there We're there to entertain uh, the actual people. Um, um, and and, and I, I love the gig because um, at that point, uh, on a break, I can, you know, if my kids are there, we go and see the animals and, and, and enjoy the exhibits. And I absolutely love, we have, it, it is rightly called the world famous San Diego Zoo for a reason. It is an absolutely magical place. And I love, I love uh, that institution. I love that facility. And, um, and I feel very blessed to be able to work there and then maybe be able to enjoy it afterwards. But no, I, I do enjoy playing for people a tad bit more, especially when they don't have fangs. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. My my little dog likes to listen to my trombone, but I'm not sure how a lion would do with that. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not interested in in testing those waters. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I uh, I am much more interested in staying as far away from them and keeping those walls as high as as, as possible, <laughs> as know. the zoo allows. Right. As the zoo allows. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, if, if you don't mind me segueing, uh, no, <laughs> Gene Picorni, uh, you I've obviously heard know, yeah, <laughs> you obviously know him very well from uh, from the uh, the Corny seminar. Uh, I I know him uh, very well as well. Gene, if, if you ever come across this, hello. Ho hopefully you're doing well. Uh, Gene and computers, time. Gene and computers uh, don't mix very well. So <laughs> if he comes across this, that would be an absolute miracle. And Gene, please, you know, call me out on on this if uh, if I have uh, you know mis misspoken. But uh, yeah, if if. If he is able to make all of those those clicks happen, and he was able to actually uh, watch all the way through to this point, that is a downright miracle. Maybe we yeah. can send him a VHS tape or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I um, so he was he was like, I mean, there were some amazing people on that Nimrod video, but he was he was the one that just really held a special place in my heart and I did everything I possibly could and I knew going into it I was going to probably need to um, go the extra mile to get his video and and God bless him he uh, was incredibly busy with some personal uh, matters and and he he carved out way too much time this you know recording a video like for the Nimrod should should take most people like about 20 minutes to open things up and he spent hours mm -hmm. and hours uh doing this and go oh gene i know you're not watching this thank you <laughs> uh but thank you thank you um but he called me up and he's like all right i have my video all done in my recorder. He he bought a brand new one of those Zoom recorders, <laughs> not Zoom as in the teleconferencing, but like one of those uh, audio video uh, devices. You know, one of those contraptions that does all all in one. Right, right. 
He bought it. It had sat in a box for months. I think he bought it at like iTech or something. You know, I mean, this is like a long time ago that he had bought this and it sat around and he finally pulled it out just for this project. And he, and he he had like five takes and he's like, I don't know. I, and, and then he called me up. He's like, so how do I get this to you? And two hours of figuring out, wait, a USB can connect to my computer computer and what is this <laughs> end for and oh it was and it most of it was through zoom and the the face of elation that went that came over him when things started working it was it was a magical moment i that 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 memory will stay with me forever um it was i mean i laughed so hard through most of that whole experience um, just to see a man that, I mean, frankly, you idolize. I mean, like when I think of the sound that's in my head, the ideal tuba sound, it's Tommy Johnson, Roger Bobo, and Gene Picorni. It's a combination of those three, you know? Um, definitely for solo playing, it's, it's almost entirely Roger, you know? For any of my freelance gigs, most, or, uh, most smaller orchestra, any chamber music, Anytime I'm in the studio, any any other time, it's it's Tommy Johnson. But anything orchestral, you know, generally it's it's it you know largely Gene is is the sound. Mm -hmm. And you see this man that you've I, idolized, and you see him struggling, and you just <laughs> want to hug him and yeah. say, Gene, it's okay. Yeah. I love that you're a human, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then you have these struggles too. Oh, but of course he picks up an instrument and you're just like, oh, I give up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I could never attain that. But, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, Gene is an absolute sweetheart of a man. I, I love him absolutely dearly. Um, uh, there was there was this, I, I, and, I, and I feel just incredibly blessed to be able to say any of those sentences, like, 10 years ago, I can't even imagine those words coming out of my mouth. Like that he is a dear friend and, and, and a one, you know, I mean, that's amazing to me. I was, I was teaching a lesson in Pittsburgh once and uh, I'm, I'd say, I think we were in Carnegie Mellon and I was teaching a lesson and I had my phone out on the stand um, for, for t with tonal energy. And, and the student was talking and we're going back and forth and the idea of the Picorni seminar had come up and, and somehow the music that he was playing sort of related to some one of my experiences with the Picorni seminar. So we talked about the Picorni seminar and we're just talking, and, oh yeah, Gene, rah, 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 rah. and just about as we're about to segue to something else, my phone lights up and, uh, and you know, I mean, look, it's not like I get calls from Gene Percorni too often, but <laughs> his name showed up. It was like his ears were burning. I, it was Good timing. Wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the student's face, like, went white. Jaw dropped. He's like, oh! <laughs> and then the blessed moment where I hit decline. <laughs> and he's like, What? <laughs> You would decline to call. I said, "Yeah, I'll call him back." No <laughs> like I didn't want to tell him that. Well, you know, you know, I, I'm probably on the phone with Gene Picorni once or twice a year. It's not like this guy is calling me every weekend, you know. Right. <laughs> but I just wanted to take that moment to go. You know, right now, you are more important to me than Gene Picorni. And uh, that was uh, that was that was a. It was a precious moment. That was it was good. It was good. That's and awesome. I called him back and I said, "Sorry, I, sorry, I ran up on you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. He's uh, he is an absolutely amazing man, uh, an amazing teacher. Absolutely, for me, he is the pinnacle of orchestral playing. You know, there's uh, many idols that I have, uh, but I, you know, he's 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 it for me. You know, he's just the sound just alone is something, you know, that uh, I continue to aspire to and I probably will until I die. So, yeah. That's so, great. I remember, Brandon, do you remember this at uh, Domain Forge? It's like a music festival in Canada that we went to. Gene Picorni was so excited about the International Space Station flying yes. overhead. 
I just remember that. It was just such a cute, yeah, yeah. cute thing. He was just so like, ah, oh, I can't wait to see it tonight. It's going to be so cool. And like, okay, yeah. I do have another story. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay. So I was, okay. I was humble blessed uh, to, uh, to do, um, to, to be able to play in, in Chicago over the summer one time. And Gene and I were, uh, we were hanging out and I said, Hey, there's an ISS. Uh, I, I looked it up before I before I left, and and there's an ISS on uh, on this day, and um, he's like, great. Oh, and we have you know the, the you know the the orchestra's not rehearsing then or whatever, so so we can <laughs> we can meet up and we can be there and we can watch it. So so uh, he's like, oh, I have the perfect spot, and so we we go into this. Uh, he wanted to show me the new building at Northwestern uh, and all this. And so we get into this parking lot and we're watching, we're looking up. And, all right, what, what's that? Northwestern. Okay. Yeah. Should be coming up right there. Oh, well, how many degrees up? Okay. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and what time? Um, 813. Okay. What time? It's 814. Okay. So we should see it right now. Right. And so I looked at the time like, three times and then I looked at the date. And I'm like, Oh no. Okay, so it's tomorrow. Um, <laughs> uh, so we had planned the entire evening oh, wow. over this whole event. <laughs> it never happened. And it just happened to be that the orchestra was performing during that flyover. So uh, oh. we were not actually able to watch it after all. Oh man. It was. Um, yeah, beep bop ba dum. You know, Gene, um, I screwed up. <laughs> I know you're my idol, but uh, yeah, I totally screwed up here. So uh, yeah, that was uh, that was egg on my face doesn't begin to uh, to describe just how humiliated I was uh, at that moment. So yeah, there you go. That's awesome. All right, enough stories, <laughs> enough name dropping. All right, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. No, I don't mean to be that guy. No, no. no worries. This is all good. I brought it up, so I, I'm sorry <laughs> as well. <laughs> so uh, Sam and I were uh, wondering, actually, how has uh, living in California uh, influenced, uh, I, I guess, the avenues, uh, using the word that you used earlier, uh, the avenues that you uh, took musically, and if do you think you would have been doing something different if you had lived or spent your life in, I don't know, someplace like Idaho or Ohio or Florida? Oh, absolutely. Without, without question. I mean, you know, I mean, living in Los Angeles, you are surrounded by Hollywood. You're surrounded by the music industry um, and the, and the, and the movie industry. Um, and so when I was growing up, um, I didn't play in an orchestra until I want to say two months before I grew from high school. I, you know, orchestra was never something on my radar. Now, that being said, as soon as I did play, and it was mind-blowing experience, it was this honor orchestra that the LA Philharmonic was putting on. And, and because I had been studying with Norm Pearson, I, you know, he encouraged me to audition and I got to audition. It was, ended up being a side-by-side -side thing. And we were playing this incredible music and I had my teacher next to me. It was you know, one of these mind blowing, life changing experiences. So, but, but then I went to USC and I'm studying with the absolute most recorded tuba player of all time. No one will ever come close, you know, thousands upon thousands of movies, you know, the number one recorded tuba player since 1960s on through the 2000s. So, um, you know, that definitely changed me and, and his encouragement to get into jazz. Uh, and, and, and also, um, there, I studied with Tommy Johnson primarily, but, you know, Jim Self was, um, was on the faculty as well, even though I did not study privately with him. Um, I, I got to just, just a couple of, a couple of lessons, but not, not really, uh, formally, you know, long-term. And so he would obviously be, um, encouraging me to explore jazz, explore, uh, obviously the, the, um, the studio scene, orchestral playing, solo playing, the, all of these different avenues were things that the teachers around me were heavily into and, and encouraged me to pursue. If I had gone to, 
you know, if I had grown up in the Midwest and I had gone to, you know, Indiana University, if I had gone to, you know, some, you know, Milwaukee or, you know, or Iowa or Michigan or any of these other places, um, I, I certainly would have been much more geared towards military band auditions, for instance, and certainly orchestral auditions. Um, you know, I may not have pursued uh, the jazz side of things more. I, I certainly, my radar would not have included studio playing. Sight reading would not have been a major component of my daily practice, you know, where I knew I needed to be able to play anything that, that came in front of me. Um, uh, so yeah, growing up in Los Angeles absolutely changed, uh, that, or it molded that, that direction and, and influenced that direction. And then, you know, when I did, I, I got married, we decided to stay in Los Angeles. It, I, you know, I, it, all of those, um, those ideas, uh, and that path was just even more entrenched, uh, the longer I stayed and studied in Los Angeles. Had I, had I gone to Switzerland? Uh, to study with Roger Bobo. Had I gone to one of the conservatories, you know, in Boston or New York or, you know, um, certainly things would have been very different. I would have gone on a much more orchestral path, you know, and, and, and done that. Instead, you know, I got heavy into, into sight reading and chamber music and jazz and all of these other avenues and um, definitely influenced the musician I am today. That's awesome. Uh, Sam, did you want to, did you want to follow up with anything or ask a question? I mean, I, I, we noticed that you have a nice t-shirt on your website and I think everybody <laughs> should go get it. Um, but uh, we would really want, we really want that t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> so, man, look, I, you know, my brother has a bunch of them sitting in his warehouse right now. He, he, nice. he prints those t-shirts. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, my motto uh, for a long time in teaching is just play good, don't suck. And uh, play good, don't suck is just just kind of the thing, you know. And, uh, you know, my pep talk just before a, a, a student is about to go on and do their senior recital, you know, I, you know, grab their shoulder and look them straight in the eye and just go, play good, don't <laughs> suck. You know, and then walk away. And, and then they feel just energized and yeah. ready to conquer the world. You know, it's the greatest pep talk ever. Um, yeah, so um, so I actually had a high school student um, who studied with me for five years and um, you know, from middle school on. And uh, and we had built a, a, a special bond. And he loved that saying, that play good, don't suck. So um, he found a, a photo of me doing this like stern look, you know, kind of thing. And he took that photo, put it on a t-shirt, said, play good, don't suck. And, um, and it was like my favorite shirt forever. And then he got ruined <laughs> in the wash. This wow. is like years ago. Yeah. He got ruined in the wash. It was terrible. And so I, I, I felt the need to resurrect that shirt. Um, and if people are enjoying it and if, if people like it, I'll have more colors and, you know, and <laughs> perhaps more sayings and, and such like that. But yeah, go to scottsutherlandmusic.com and click on the store and, and you can, you too can have my face <laughs> on your chest with a stern message of encouragement. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's, uh, I, I wanted to feed that plug a little bit. You know, I, I like, yeah, I really I like the shirt. So. Actually, I haven't, I haven't really <laughs> talked about that. I, you know, um, at, at one point I have a Patreon and, and I, I offered it to encourage people to sign up for Patreon. I, I, I gave some, some of those shirts out to uh, Patreon people. So I think there's probably a dozen people out there out in the world right now that that own a play good don't suck shirt but that can uh when that nimrod project uh, uh launched i i just i i just threw that up there on on the website including the the arrangement you can buy the arrangement um that's all i have on the store right now that i have plans to expand that with a lot of my arrangements uh, a lot of my uh uh, I have warm-ups, you know, um, I have uh, background tracks to warm-ups, kind of the Michael Davis kind of thing um, that, uh, that I'm going to be launching over the, over the next few weeks. Uh, but, I, you know, just on a whim, I, I threw up that, uh, that Play Good, Don't Suck shirt on there. And, uh, you know, 
people are interested, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, click on that link and uh, you too. My, my face. Because uh, who, who wouldn't want my face on there? person <laughs> well i know brandon and i are both going to get a shirt now so okay yeah, we're definitely, <laughs> yeah, we're definitely, yeah. <laughs> next next uh, podcast we'll be wearing it you can see it oh, Check it out. oh i look forward to it hey, do not disappoint me not. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good well uh, i mean out of out of, out of uh, curiosity as well uh as a good lover of uh of uh beer and whiskey if you will you uh, oh. on in your bio, uh, <laughs> yes. You said, yeah, yeah. If, if you don't mind talking a bit about that, and uh, I know that uh, us tuba players we're uh, known to have uh, a drink or two, if you will, after <laughs> after a concert. Uh, when we when trombone we players at, too. In your opinion, when we look at the uh, drink menu, uh, what what should we what should we uh, go for? Oh yeah, you see, um, I I I actually didn't start drinking it until I was about late 20s um right. and what i realized is that um it's because anytime anybody handed me something it was usually kind of you know for lack of a better word pedestrian mm. um you know it, it was the miller light <laughs> that they were handing me and i said oh, I, I just don't like this you know and you know or they're handing me their uh you know their jim bean and mm. i'm tasting it going oh i Apparently, I don't like bourbon and, uh, you know, or their black label, you know, and I'm tasting it. I guess I don't like scotch. And then I realized that I just actually have really expensive taste. Mm. And that's my problem. Um, so um, not really. Ex I can't afford really expensive, but I appreciate really expensive. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, craft beer is, uh, you know, for, for me. Craft Beer USA is San Diego, and that is happens to be where I live. And and so if you get a really good kind of New England style hazy IPA uh, from Virgin, which is about well, it's a bike ride for me down the street. Nice. Um, that is definitely what I go to. I, I'm not sure what their distribution is, but man, the smaller I, the thing that I learned while I was going on tour was to find the most local thing I possibly could. I, I love supporting local businesses. Local beer is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I love to, uh, talking it up with brewed. I, I brewed, uh, you know, myself uh, independently. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. I happen to be a, one of those, one of those guys that is into hoppy uh, beers. I also love Belgians. Um, Trappist beers are some of my favorites. Um, and uh but then on the beer side i am very much into single malt um i lagavulin's you know 16 is, is mm -hmm. one of my favorites you know the uh, uh Lefroig and you know the pd pd the better you know uh and um and then bourbon too i love a booker's uh, <laughs> uh four rows of single barrel oh <laughs> It's uh, my jam, man. It's my jam. I love, oh man, I'm getting thirsty right now. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of the thing, you know. And, and what it disheartens me because as soon as I start loving something, I realize that about a year or two later that it seems to be the most popular thing. Everyone's into hot beers, and I, you know, and I'm like, oh, now I got to find something else to be trendy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> now it's like bourbon is the true hipster. Spirit. The true hipster. Yeah. I love it. Oh yeah. No, I don't have a beard for it. I can't grow my hair. <laughs> and now it's, it's all right. So that's that's what uh, you know. The best thing I could usually find if we were in some small town in in the Midwest, the best thing I could find on the beer menu was like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and it pained me to. But it's like the only thing. And then <laughs> and then if, if if it was you know some sort of cheap. Uh, you know, spirits, I, I just ended up getting a rum and Coke just to kind of yep. mask the taste of the terrible rum that was thrown in there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, well, the things that we do <laughs> to make sure that we're supporting yes. local bars. Right. right. <laughs> the struggle is real. Well, well, since you're, since you're getting thirsty, ah, there you go. That solves the problem right there. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right, man. <laughs> But uh, I thought we could wrap it up uh, with some yeah. rapid fire questions if you Great. think that's cool. So first one, 
Favorite movie soundtrack? Star Wars. No, sorry, Empire Strikes Back. Empire okay. Strikes Back. Nice. All right. If you didn't play tuba, you would be a? I would probably be a restaurant tour. I would open a restaurant, probably like pizzas, and probably have a killer uh, beer and wine and uh, spirit list. Nice. There awesome. we go. Um, let's see. Since you're doing all the duets on Instagram, like the tuba Rona duets, uh, who of any musician, past or present, would you want to play with? I, 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 I would love to have actually played a duet and, 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 and produced something with my teacher, Toppy Johnson. Nice. I never, never got to have that opportunity. Cool. What is the last thing you listened to? Oh, um, the last thing I listened to, <laughs> um, it probably was a project, um, uh, uh, you know, Christus Factus Est, uh, the uh, Gradual, uh, by Bruckner. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a collaboration with Tim Higgins, uh, cool. trombone and tuba of, of that. So, really so cool. you gotta listen to the original and everything else. For so. sure. Yeah, definitely. All right. And the last one. If you could eliminate one beer from the face of the earth, what would it be? Oh, Corona. Is that the answer right now? <laughs> so right now? Corona. I applaud that. That's like that's incredible. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I think they're trying to change the name, aren't they? Are they? I, I think believe so. it. They're Actually, you know, <laughs> and I have I have a secondary reason. They bought out one of my favorite breweries. Um uh the folks that own Corona yeah. bought out uh, one of my favorite breweries, one of the San Diego original San Diego breweries. And so I just, mm, Corona. Yeah. So when mm -hmm. coronavirus hit, I was like, Woo <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Get them well, out of here. Well, that's all I got. That, I don't know. Brandon, you got another right. one? I'm not sure. Uh, it looks like we have a hello sent over to uh, Scott on our uh, oh. live stream. Uh, let me pull it up here. Wes uh, says, hello, Scott, from New Jersey. Loving the Corona hey. bus cut and the Millennium Falcon. Of course, that would be your background. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Wes, how are you doing? <laughs> Wes is, a, Wes is a, a great a great buddy, and uh, he's a fabulous tuba player and college professor, and uh, and uh, and he is uh, one of my good friends, and he... Uh, and he and his lovely wife, uh, she plays trombone, and uh, they took uh, took me to a serendipity in New York City the last time I was there. Hmm. It's this amazing uh, uh, dessert shop. Yeah, and, and, oh, oh my gosh, sugar and I. <laughs> we go hand in hand just like bourbon. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, uh, Wes is a is is a just one of these, uh, you know, individuals that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So, hi, Wes. <laughs> thanks for, <laughs> thanks for uh, chiming in. <laughs> awesome. Well, Mr. Sullivan, thank you very much. Oh, uh, dude, work, guys, uh, this was great. Thank Sam you. Brandon, thank, thank you so you. much for the invitation. This was absolutely amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really well, thank you appreciate it. Thank and you. Best of luck uh, <laughs> on the future. Thanks uh, so much. Let me know if I can help out. Yeah. Absolutely. This is, this is wonderful. We would love to have you back on at some point too. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, take care. Uh, stay safe, healthy, well, uh, yeah, and we'll too. see you later. Hopefully, we uh, cross paths in person once this is all over. With little. love, with love some to. shirts, with some yeah, yeah, Scott Sullivan yes, shirts on. Yes, we got to get a picture. All right, <laughs> absolutely. All right, let's make that happen. Young people, call. Definitely. Right? Don't, don't work. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. All right. Bye, Scott. Bye-bye.